Hi, everybody. My name is Alan. On behalf of the crew, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. You know, it's interesting. Uh, this is the second show we've done today. It, probably a lot of you know that, you know, the way the, you know, bridging uh, logistics are is, you know, we come in and we get the crew in this incredible all volunteer crew who've been doing it for years and years and years. Uh, we come in and we set up and we do two shows because once all the equipment is set up, even with our own studio, it makes it a lot easier and it seems to be, you know, a nice way to do it. And, you know, during the first show today, I was talking about, you know, the new paradigms and, you know, how, you know, we're coming into that. And then as part of that, I was realizing it's interesting because the first guest was Michael Tamora and he was born in Japan and tonight's guest Gary Bennell was born in the United States and spends a good part of the year teaching in Japan and it's just an interesting thing how as we come into these new paradigms what is breaking down is a lot of the the rigidity of the way we look at time and space and countries and religions and all those institutions that maybe at their root had the intention to be supportive and the intention of being loving and intention of being beneficial to the human spirit and the human soul but perhaps over time as they went into their humanness in a sense end up being more separating and more divisive than they intended to be but that all those things now, I mean, through the internet, through, through, you know, the videos that are available, through so many things, through people growing up here and teaching there and growing up there and teaching here and, and people just moving from place to place to place, that, that we're becoming this universal species that those things that have seemingly divided us in the past, the countries and the, the races and the religions and the sexual preferences, people are caring less and less. And people from all parts of the world are, are gaining availability of information and knowledge and time and space. When you're on the internet, when you're watching one of the bridging shows, you can be in any country in the world. Who knows what time it is? Who knows where the boundaries are? Who knows if you crossed over into a, a new space now with these new mobile applications? So, so many of the things that created the division and divisiveness and the separation, the feelings of separation in us, are falling by the wayside by these new energies, these new paradigms, and how fortunate we are that that they are breaking down. Because the truth is, is that we are all connected by our essence. We are all connected by the truth of who we are. We are all connected by that internal energy, that internal vibration that we call God, or some people call God, or the Creator, or that internal energy. And the more we can break down those barriers that prevent us from experiencing that, then hopefully, and what is happening, is that people are more experiencing their true nature, their divinity, their infinite quality, their inclusiveness in that, in that love, really. So as that happens, more and more new paradigms are built on the new paradigms. And more and more those things that divide us and break us down are losing their luster, are losing their power over us. And how blessed and fortunate that is. Because behind that and underneath that and through that and further up and further in from there is our connection, is our oneness, is our love. And that, that is what's happening now. And it's just, it's interesting to see how even in the little metaphor that's the show Bridging Heaven and Earth, how we see it in two shows. I mean, it wasn't planned that way. And we had a Japanese-born person who teaches mostly in America and an American-born person who teaches in Japan. I mean, it's just, isn't that amazing. But, you know, really we see it all the time with where we're getting hits from, you know, when people watch the bridging shows all over the world. And they watch from places and we get emails from places that they're not supposed to be able to watch them as countries go, as governments go. But in two minutes somebody hacks around it and makes it available. So, you know, here's an opportunity again. 
And again, you know, the guest tonight, you know, who lives on the East Coast of the United States, who spends a lot of time in Japan with his, you know, uh, mysticism school there, has come to California to share his love and his gifts and his understandings with us. Gary Bunnell has been a student of mysticism and uh, metaphysics for 50 years. He studied all over the world. Uh, he's an ordained minister and world-renowned spiritual leader uh, that has taught all over the world. And he's founded the School for Mystical uh, Knowing, as I said, in Japan. And he's a multi-published author of uh, books that you probably heard about, The Knowing, Ascension, and the newest one, uh, or actually the newest one is The Knowing, but he also did uh, Your Book of Life, among others. So an extraordinary, you know, gifted being and teacher who's come a long way to share his knowledge and gifts and realizations with us. And as most of you know, we also show videos on the show that also are manifestations and intentions of that love, of, of that connection. And two really beautiful friends of bridging, uh, Aaron Pine, who we've shown one of his videos before, and Roger Klosterman, who does the music, uh, they put together this very, very beautiful art music video. So we're going to show two different parts of that, of these beautiful beings who want to collaborate, who want to share, who want to create, create together collaboratively and joyously. So you'll see the very beautiful videos. And also we have, as most of you know, we're in the middle of an international healing art project that came as a dream, it came as a vision, uh, to reach out to the world and say, let's use this bridging uh, experience and al allow those people, to anybody who wants to, any age, any skill level, any, any size, any format of art, to produce a new original piece based on the theme Bridging Heaven and Earth. Send it to us here. We'll put it on this extraordinarily beautiful website, Heaven to Earth Art. We'll show it on the Bridging Shows. We have art projects. We have art gallery openings. And it came as a vision to have as a healing, as an acupuncture for the planet, to have all these people with that intent of producing something with the intention of bridging heaven and earth, what that would mean to them and their create, creative process as part of the collaboration. So we have two pieces. One is by Aaron Pine, who did the video, and the other is by a local person, Tim Garcia, from the Channel Islands of California, a beautiful photograph. So join me in a short meditation, and then we'll have the first uh, Aaron uh, Roger video. Thank you. So as I said, this is a beautiful art music video. We'll show the first part of it. It's by Aaron Pine and Roger Klosterman. The art and video production is by Aaron. The music is by Roger. Uh, Aaron is a visionary artist. He's a sacred graphic web designer. He's a video designer. Uh, he's an energy healer, a meditation teacher, and just a joyous being who wants to collaborate, to spread the love, to spread the healing, to, to be of service. And Roger's an extraordinary musician, sound healer, and collaborator as well. So you'll, you'll love it. So enjoy.
Hi, everybody. Welcome back. So thank you, Aaron and Roger, for doing that beautiful piece. Again, art and video production by Aaron and music by Roger. Uh, and the beautiful piece you're seeing in between Gary and I is a piece that Aaron did for the art project called Goddess of Heaven and Earth. It's a printed digital photograph art, and Aaron is from Cincinnati, Ohio, a really beautiful collaborator. And again, anybody who wants to be part of the art project, please join us. It helps in the healing. It helps in the acupuncture. So welcome, Gary. It's great to have you here. Yeah, thank you. I've been waiting with anticipation all summer. So Really? Is yeah, that true? It's, yeah. It's been great. Yeah, good. So we were talking a little early, and you said that a lot of these experiences came at a fairly early age for you in terms right. of, why don't you talk about how you first came into it and Ooh. how you moved through it? And um, uh, basically, I, I had a, a family life that was just horrible. It was just, um, my stepfather was this incredibly evil guy. When I say evil, he, uh, he drank a lot, and when he would drink, he would get very mean. So uh, in one of his little rants, he pistol whipped me into unconsciousness. But basically what happened was when, he, when I went unconscious, I literally went out of body. And it was, uh, you know, I, of course, didn't know what to think of it. I was floating above my body and above my brother and sister. And, and he was stunned. He didn't know what to do. And, and um, so from that point on, I, I have been going out of body uh, almost every day of my life since then. It slowed down a lot now as I've gotten older, but uh, the intention was to, to learn as much as I could. And just as I was about to quit, uh, going out of body uh, was boring. Uh, no one was there. I could, could spy on my friends, and it would freak them out when I would tell them. And you know, um, my mother got really tired of me running for the door and not opening the door, thinking I was in my astral body and smashing the screen through. And so it was one of those childhoods filled with a bunch of uh, wonderful esoteric accidents. But just as I was about to quit, I ran into a spirit, uh, for lack of a better term, a guy named Eli, a male energy named Eli. And uh, he was healing my brother. My brother was hit by a car and in a coma for three months. And I would go out of body to see my brother, and I couldn't find him. He was not near his body. His etheric body wasn't there. And what I've come to know later is an etheric body. It wasn't around his body. And there was a cord going up into this incredible uh, cloud in the sky. And so um, I would go there every day and, and pray for him. I was hearing a voice at that time. And this voice was a female voice. And it would tell me what to do, things that I could, could, could do with my brother. And um, so after the three-month coma, he came out of it completely healed. There was no damage left over. There was nothing, you know, normally people would have brain damage. And, but uh, uh, I met this guy named Eli, this male energy named Eli, and he took me into the Akashic Records for the first time. And that's when my journey really began. So for people who are unfamiliar, okay. we'll have to describe the Akashic uh, Records. The Akashic Records, uh, it's, the, it's the concept that um, everything is energy. Your consciousness, and, and there's only consciousness and energy in creation. And while consciousness is a form of energy, it is not like evolutionary energy. It's uh, consciousness existed from the very beginning, whole and complete, can't be altered. Uh, nothing that, that consciousness witnesses uh, in any way affects it. Um, uh, it. We call that a soul. We call our, our consciousness a soul. And we call our human uh, being, the, the body that we're in, that is a spirit, a human spirit that helps to form that body. So um, the consciousness actually records everything, every minor detail. As it comes into uh, to take an incarnation, it also plans all the immutable events of that timeline, the things that it will use to experience itself while it is here. And the Akasha is, is where all of that is recorded and all of it's maintained. So when you're in the Akashic Records, we can look you know, at a person's life and literally see the immutable points of that life. And based on who they've been in past lives, we can predict how they're going to respond to the immutable event of this life. And then be, by virtue of that, we can also kind of look at how their circumstances will unroll. So because our thoughts create our circumstances. 
So uh, the Akasha is that place where it's all recorded. Okay, so Eli took you there, and right. what did you guys do there? Um, he, Eli first showed me, or first helped me to see my life, what, what was unfolding for me, uh, why the stepfather, what we had done in past lives, why we were together in this life, uh, why my family, why my mother, who was um, willing to work two and three jobs, but, but not willing to be a mother kind of thing, why all of those, those conditions and everything played out. So uh, the first chore was to get me centered and balanced so that I could begin to look at, at other things. I was told uh, at that time that I would be a teacher at some point in my life, and not knowing what that meant, I certainly didn't want to be a school teacher, hated school. Uh, you know, I, I was good at it, but I hated it. You know, I don't like being told what to do. And so, um, basically, he showed me who I would be and showed me how life was ordered and showed me the people that I would connect with and, and who would influence my life. And, Wow. Well, from there, yeah. And so what was the next like real pivotal movement for you into being the fullness of who you are? Um, when I was, well, I had a, I had a near-death experience just before I left um, the uh, situation I was in with my stepfather. Um, I, had, I had plotted to kill him many times, you know, lying awake at night. And in Melbourne, Florida, uh, in the summer times in the 50s, it was hot, you know, and at night you can't go to sleep. You just can't go to sleep. So I would lay there and I would plot on how I was going to kill this guy. And um, uh, he was a carpenter, and I went to work with him one day, and he had been drinking early in the morning. And uh, I, would, didn't, I did something, and he said, you know, it's my fault, and it's always, you know, and he started to take his belt off. And I I just said, you know, you can't do this anymore. And um, I was the first time I'd ever felt the fullness of myself in my body. And um, in that moment, I literally became like this, this Shaolin fighter, this Shaolin warrior. And I picked up a board and uh, a, a regular level, and he picked up a, a shovel and you know, we started at each other, and uh, several days later, they released him from the hospital. Wow. It was, uh, I could literally feel the energy just flowing through my body. It was like with the, the level in my hand, it was not a level, it was me. And it was a turning point because I realized that all of this thing about consciousness and energy is true, that it, there is just consciousness and energy. And the barriers that you place within yourself, um, once you release those, once those conflicts are released, that you are unlimited. And so that began my, my serious course of study in metaphysics. And right after that, I went to live with my grandmother in Los Gatos, California. I had been born there and then had moved away. And uh, she was uh, a student, a meditation student of Paramahansa Yogananda. Oh, uh -huh. And uh, she had uh, Satya Sai Baba and and a bunch of people she had known in her life. And so I got uh, introduced to uh, Kriya Yoga very early. So all through my teenage years, I spent um, time studying Kriya and, and became even more balanced. So that yeah, was... And, and when did you feel that it was appropriate for you to, to be able to share this? Um, not until after I had uh, raised my daughters. When my daughters, uh, when I actually turned over the keys <laughs> uh, to each daughter, I was so happy when each daughter got married, not because I didn't like the responsibility, but I knew that with the last daughter marrying that I could then be free to do what I really wanted to do. That the promises I had made to my children before they were even married were the things that were driving my intention until they were no longer you know, my responsibility that they now had a partner in life. So that's when, it, that's when I started actually teaching meditation classes. Wow, that's yeah. an amazing story. Yeah. But I had, you know, by that time I had, uh, with two partners that helped to, you know, in business helped open uh, 35 retail stores. And, you know, we, I'd been a successful photographer and commercial illustrator. And so I'd lived several lives within that period. So. 
And during that period, because you had seen the Akashic Records of the Self, did you know that something else was coming? Did you miss being able to, to use that part of yourself? How did that go well, for Well, I didn't, I wasn't in high school and in college, I wasn't very social. I, um, I dated four times uh, in, through high school and undergraduate studies. And uh, the reason uh, was, was that I, uh, the subjects of most conversations of people um, to me were just simply not appealing. It was, you know, people were, were wanting to be popular and wanting to be liked and, and to me, it, uh, I listened to Michael on the, on the first show that was taped today. And, you know, it's like uh, all that external stuff, etern you know, external stuff that, that everybody was trying to get through, I had gotten through. And it was really difficult for me. So um, I befriended a lot of, of meditators, yoga people, um, and spent my time with older people. So in, in getting through my life, um, it was easy for me to transition into being this responsible adult because I had been literally uh, responsible since the age of 10, basically, after I had figured out or was shown who I was. And so you turn the keys over, and then and you felt a certain freedom to, oh, yeah. to be, to come into your own in a sense, to come into your service, to your destiny in, a, in that specific way of being a healer? Well, um, there's an esoteric mysticism. There's a, there's a Gnostic path that um, the religions in the Middle East kind of squashed. Uh, the Gnostic path was a path of, of compassion, a path of truth, a path of, of knowledge. It was a gnosis. And yeah, we had, I don't know if you're familiar with Philip Gardner. He yeah. wrote, yeah. yeah, he was a guest and had written a book, right. I think the Gnosis. Or, right. yeah. And uh, that path said you are both divine and you are both animal. You're, you're these two beings in this one experience. And uh, when you understand the dynamic of being a human from that macro viewpoint, um, you, can, you can't be selfish. You can't sit back and not offer something, not give, uh, you know, through your heart, through your center. Um, and, you know, that was my path, was to be a teacher. And when I started it, uh, my, my wife right now says that when I'm on stage, I just, there's a different light, there's a different brightness. So, yeah. Wow. It's been fun. It, it's not over. No, it's not over. And then <laughs> way, way before, we have people, hundreds of people going through our school in Japan every year. And um, when, they, when, they hear, when they hear this truth of, of sovereignty and, and com, you know, sovereignty uh, you know, empowered by compassion, when they hear of this truth that, that you know, life is so simple, it's just so simple, and that we make it we make it difficult. Um, we have a our first first three months of our one year program focuses people on giving up the need to be right. And it, uh, again, referencing Michael earlier, um, we all get when we're young we get stroked when we do something right we get we get treated with, you know with with candies or whatever we get hugged we get held we get out of girls and out of boys. And when we don't, you know, we're isolated, we're punished, we're pushed away. So being right and being lovable becomes this, this mesh of energy. Like we want to be lovable we, and, and we want to be right. So it, it gets all, you know, combined and uh, that competitiveness comes out and that being right um, gets so strong that if we have a negative self-opinion, if we have a spark inside of us that that when it looks in the mirror, it says, wait a minute, I don't like what I'm seeing. We will go to enormous lengths to be right about how wrong we are. To be very strong about it. Oh, yeah. It's like, and so we get this, this whole thing going about right and wrong. And, and um, when the Japanese, and, and I have to tell you, the Japanese have a difficult culture. It's extremely difficult. Um, they are told what to do. They have obligations you can't they go imagine. back thousands of yeah, years they, only. Yeah, oh, right. absolutely. And it's in their DNA, just like... Tradition. And yeah, it's tradition, and it's there. And they have words in the language that, that literally impale them on these, 
obligations and traditions. So when they start hearing this, you start to see these lights going on inside of them. It is literally like you've reached in and turned on a switch. And it's just amazing. So when people say, why do you teach in Japan so much? It's like, you know, everyone in America has heard this story. Everyone in America kind of gets it because, you know, we're taught to be independent. We're taught in some ways how to think. Well, in Japan, they're taught how to memorize. They're taught how to, how to look at things as they've been looked at for thousands of years. You know, we have, we believe that, you know, in America, we believe that, that, 200 years is a long time, you know, and in Japan they think 200 miles is a long distance, you know. Right. So when you look at the difference between our cultures, it's amazing for me as a Westerner to go into an Eastern culture like that and be so warmly accepted, and I'm teaching things that are so juxtaposed to what they've known. And Gnostic mysticism is so far away from Shinto tradition that it's quite amazing. So uh, I teach there. Um, it's thrilling for me. Wow! It's it's yeah, thrilling it to see. Beautiful. Yeah, to see this to see this light go on. I mean, in the states, I I you know used to do a lot of lecture in the eighties in the states. I was on a lot of talk shows and radio shows and lecturing, and um, I would give a guided meditation, and I would say, you know, imagine yourself a meter off the floor, three feet off the floor, and you know, and then take people through a guided meditation and then ask people for feedback afterwards. And they would say, the guy said, well, you know, um, I didn't know what a meter was, so I just went up to the ceiling. Or I'd say, go on a, up a staircase. And so I said, you know, I, I hate the stairs, so I, I imagine an escalator. It's like in Japan, when you give instruction, you know that when you're suggesting something that they're exactly a meter off the floor. And if you suggest 33 steps, they have counted each step. It's that kind a of tremendous intensity. rigidity. Yeah. yeah, but it's also that kind of intensity that that when they see this as an opportunity to break free of Oh, they'll take they'll oh be please. so precise and yeah. take every opportunity. Absolutely. And and it just it's beautiful to watch it. And here in the States it's a it's a little bit less receiving because people have heard so much. They've been overexposed in so many ways to Everything. Everything. Yeah, everything. <laughs> everything. We have 289 channels, for God's sakes. Actually, it's interesting. My brother, who's here today, I mean, he lives in, in Long Island. Mm -hmm. And he had, you know, this new cable station, a new channel came in. And they had literally had like, I don't know, four or 500. Oh. And I looked down the list, and there was zero for self-improvement, yeah. you know, anything uplifting, empowering, oh. inspiring. And there was... You know NASCAR three yeah. and how how can that be important? And how can there be none yeah. a zero? Yeah. And well, it was it was amazing to me that all the stations were of something else. When when we um, it was mentioned earlier 2011 2012 um, uh, every 13,000 years human consciousness goes through a primary shift, and this is the shift we are. Time has an end won't end. Uh, we are stepping beyond the boundary of time. There, that is the whole consciousness, is to move with the shift past time as and a boundary or a limitation. And space almost as yeah. well. Yeah, well, right. space will be there because it's an evolving energy. But right. time is something that we can, we can push and, and mold and, and right. make our own. So. so maybe what we'll do is talk about that. We'll start okay. out with that in the next section. Sure. So what we'll do is show the second half of the... Uh, the Aaron Roger art music video. Again, you've seen half of it. It's so beautiful. Just, you'll, you'll love it. Enjoy. Thank you. 
Hi everybody, welcome back. So thanks Aaron, thanks Roger for sending that in. And the extraordinary piece you see in between uh, Gary and I is by Tim Garcia. He's from a local, he comes to a lot of the shows. He's a, uh, a, this is a photograph, he's a chiropractor healer from the Channel Islands, California. And he's an extraordinary photographer and just a beautiful being who's, you know, wants to be part of a healing, wants to be part of a collaboration and just, is really an extraordinary healer, you know, in his chiropractic practice. So we're very lucky to have this piece by Tim. So, uh, Gary, so we were talking about, you know, time and space and how you see, you know, the movement in that. Why don't you talk a little about that? Well, in that? the Akashic Records, it shows that, um, that coming from the center of creation, there are these pulsations of energy. Um, uh, scientists have actually been able to look back and see these waves. They can actually see these ringlets of energy. Um, but what they don't see is they don't see the minor, minor waves of energy between these large rings. And every 13,000 years, human consciousness shifts polarity from, from unity to separation and duality and then back to unity again. So uh, uh, the transition wave for that is about 1,000 years thick. So about 500 years ago, we entered this transition wave. So at the midpoint of the transition wave, which is, is 500 years, then the energy on the planet the, that is influencing consciousness, soul consciousness, begins to shift to the opposite polarity. In this case, uh, uh, we are going into unity. Um, the culture of Atlatia ended in separation. So it when... 13,000 years ago, we went into separation. Now, uh, Michael talked about we choose war. Well, actually, what happens in the Akasha, it shows that our inner conflicts are really what guides us in life. Uh, we, we think our religions and we think our, our great ideas and philosophies are the things that actually guide us in our choices and, and how we behave and everything else. But it really is the conflicts within us that guide us. And as we move toward unity, this these two separate beings that have one human experience, this eternal being and this evolving being, are naturally in conflict with each other. And then if we have a lot of layered conflict within us about who we are, or, you know, what life is or how things are ordered, then that begins to show out through our behaviors, our human, our animal side, that evolving side. The evolving side wants to exist, wants to continue. And the eternal side has all the time it ever needs. It's eternal. It won't ever cease to exist. But this animal side wants to ensure its, its longevity. So it will use the power within those conflicts to bring about the necessary, necessary changes in its life to ensure its longevity. So we're now at that midpoint in this transition wave. And the Mayans saw it as 2012. And uh, in the Akashi, it shows it. Uh, Actually, the height of it is between 2011 and 2012, that year period. And what's happening is because we, we haven't released our conflicts, our conflicts as we move from separation to unity have to manifest outward so that we can release them. And that comes to us as war. We, it comes to us as you know, us trying to destroy the thing that looks like it's trying to destroy us. You know, we have 9-11, we have... You know, we have any number of things that have gone on, you know, since 500 years ago that we could point to. Um, you know, Christianity uh, 500 years ago began a hor horrible campaign against other religions uh, that has lasted only until just recently. Well, the Crusades, they did oh. it against themselves. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it was like you couldn't get out of it. So the conflict of that where, where you know, um, you're not, you're a sinner, you're not, you know, God doesn't like you, only likes his son. I mean, that whole conflict thing that happened. Um, 
That's what we're seeing manifesting now, and it actually will get worse between, between now and 2012. And what will get worse about it is the size of the weapons, not the intention. The intention is there, and they're already throwing rocks and stones. It's the size of the weapons that are going to become more of a problem than anything. I think it was Einstein that said, I know, I know what weapons they used in the Second World War. I don't know which they'll use in the third, but in the fourth they'll use sticks and stones because it's going to take, send us way back if we do that to ourselves. But um, in the Akasha, it shows that this is the beginning of a, a brilliant age, an age of, of uh, profound uh, understanding, an age where we go beyond all the things that we have seen as limitations, where energy, we suddenly grasp the concept of energy. Nature never has run out of energy. I mean, when you look at the planet Earth, it doesn't have an energy crisis. Um, it's because we're artificial here on the planet, basically. Um, as an eternal being in an evolving body, we are truly artificial because if these two aspects separate, then the one dies. So the human body in its artificialness has become soul dependent. It can't exist without a soul. Um, some of the prophecies suggest that there will be a human born without a soul, but you know, uh, that would point to cloning. Uh, if you understand why a soul is attracted to its form, uh, cloning would bypass that, and we would create literally a human without a soul. And they, a lot of the end times prophecies suggest that that's going to happen. Some people say they've already uh, cloned primates, so we're not that far from it. But this period, this, this time is, is ripe for us on the planet. And those people who have released their conflict, who've really, who've really cleansed themselves of, of you know, the judgment of their life and the life around them, those people are going, the meek, are literally going to inherit the earth. Those people that would rather die than kill, that, that understand the unique nature of a human experience, um, those people are the ones who are going to who take over and make this planet something that is unimaginable. It's hard to even imagine it. So that's what it shows in the Akasha. So when I hear all these, these, you know, the earth is going to be destroyed and a comet's gonna hit it and yeah, comets hit the earth. I mean, we have evidence and we have technology now to where we can in many ways help ourselves with that regard. Um, the consciousness, there's a group on the planet that are literally shielding the earth from such intrusions. So we're going to have a couple of near misses that will, that will mess up our atmosphere a little bit. But um, the earth is going to be here. It's going to be free of the conflict. After 2026 in the Akasha, it shows the planet of the earth with about 500 million people. How many are here now? 6.3 million, or 6.3 billion. Oh, so there are a lot of people who are going to be leaving <laughs> by, by 2020. By choice or, or, or otherwise. Because they haven't, they haven't seen, looked at themselves and released the conflict within. Uh, natural disasters were, were due for, you know, in Southern California, it's due for a big one. Um, you know, it, it's going to be uh, pretty tough for some people, but you know, the, it's not about the economy. It's not. It's literally about human intention and and whether or not you want to live a life that's free of conflict. And that's what we teach in our in the school in in Tokyo. You you can't progress. You could you could be a great philosopher. You could be the best meditator in the room. And if you're loaded with conflict, you're just going to be the best meditator in the room. You won't go beyond that. And so what are the, the, uh, the ideas around the feelings, the techniques, the way to disconnect yourself from, from this conflict that's creating? Well, the first thing is to drop self-judgment. When, you know, just stop participating in self-judgment. And most people say, well, how do you do that? Well, you just simply stop it. You, you, when it comes up, you go, that's, I'm no longer a part of me. That's, I don't participate. 
And, and part of it is not taking credit either. So you don't take credit, right. you don't take blame. You know, you know it's, it's really about uh, acknowledging yourself as a sovereign being, that the judgments you have placed against yourself, you started learning when you were really young. And it's the parental voice that continues within you that really is that loop of judgment, of self-judgment. So when we give up the need to be right, uh, as Michael said earlier, we don't give up our intellect. Our intellect actually becomes a sharper tool. We are able to use the intellect then at levels of Tesla and Einstein and you know uh, these brilliant people who changed our world. Um, when you give up the need to be right, you become right in so many ways. And it's that releasing of that and, and then not participating in that parental voice that really is the work. And everything else after that, you could be, you could study yoga, you could study Taekwondo, you could study anything. And then after you've, you've done that process of releasing that inner voice, that conflict, um, then everything comes to you, like your abilities that you've honed in past lifetimes. Uh, when I was eight years old, I, I asked my parents for oil paints. It, you know, eight-year-old kids don't ask that, and it was literally because all of those abilities, once I had gotten out of body, all of those abilities started coming back to me. Um, music, I knew music. Um, I, I have a, the mind of an engineer, I can build things. I understand tensile strengths and leverage points and, and I understand finance. And, and retail. And retail, and it's like, <laughs> so you know. A man who knows retail. <laughs> those are, yeah, that, hated, that's the key. Yeah, I hated the holidays. So I can imagine. <laughs> So, <laughs> but the still, I mean, that's the question. No, I don't, no, 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 okay. no, no, no. So Pavlov, you right. lost that yeah, part. Yeah, I've lost that fact. Because I had a certain point in my life where I, the fax machine would bring oh. weird stuff. So for a really long time, every time I'd hear the fax number, I really would get that sick feeling. That's like, <laughs> so I, I was wondering, I mean, not so much anymore, but I do remember it. Oh, absolutely. So I was lucky to only spend 12 years in retail. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. That's so. great. But, you know, we were talking earlier that so many people have so many skills now. And yeah. Because as you free up all that yeah. space, sure. that, you know, all these abilities and skills. And, you know, I tell people, what would you do if you were the first person who ever had to do it? Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? So you wouldn't carry all those concepts. Yeah. And, and the great thing is, is that meditation and yoga and, and all these different technologies that we've had for so long actually help you to take a moment where you're no longer being beat up with a, your conflict. So just in that slight, a little yeah, space, yeah. that little space allows genius. And, and every one of us are these profound beings that have great knowing when we aren't focused on our conflict. Yeah, I talk about it. it's like emptying the weight out of our backpack and as we start to stand up, you know, we wonder why the, the society or, or our life screws us, well, you're bent over yeah, and that's exactly. what a society does. So if you stand up, it's not such a good angle. And if you're lifting <laughs> off, as they say, yeah. as they say. <laughs> so. don't, don't pick up for the soap, huh? Don't bend over for the soap. Well, don't yeah. pick over because your backpack is yeah. so full. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But that's that's what you know. A lot of people say it's it's Buddh you know Buddhism, or a lot of people say it's the you know this path or that path. It really isn't religion. Religion isn't a path. It's it's the path is you. The path is is getting straight with yourself. Like stop the internal dialogue that has you bad. In, or has you anything. It has if you it, anything. If it has you as something, it's going to have you as bad yeah, yeah, sooner yeah. or later. Eventually. Yeah, sure. If you're a superhero inside and everything you do, then you've got a problem also. Right, because yeah. it's going to turn its ugly yeah. head. So if you're neutral, right. you can actually begin to acknowledge yourself. You can actually see what's in the mirror instead of these projections from the past that always seem to show up at the least opportune moment. Yeah, it's an amazing time. Yeah. And, and so you're seeing, I mean, because you travel a lot and you've traveled a lot for a lot of years. Yeah. I mean, do you see more and more people all over the world Absolutely. ready for that and trying to get yeah. <clears throat> yeah, people, you know, uh, I have one of those personalities where if I stop for a hamburger, the girl or the guy leans out and starts telling me their problems, you know, when they're giving me their burger. Um, so I hear a lot of conversation of, from people and, and I, their lives are getting better. It, it's, they're getting more content with what they are and, and what they have. 
and it's because they can really see who they are. And then suddenly the inventory in their life is something they realize they want. And, and so this contentment is beginning to, to move in. Um, the more conflict we release, the greater the potential for happiness and contentment. And it, 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 it's so simple. It doesn't require going to mass every, you know, it doesn't require. Or twisting yourself in a certain thing yeah. or being in a tradition for 500 yeah. years. Now, pranayama is pretty good, though. That helps. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of pranayama. Yeah, you think? Yeah, yeah. Breathe, just breathe. Yeah. Right. Well, that would be a start. I mean, <laughs> you got to be breathing. So uh, it, it's interesting because, you know, we, I don't know if you saw it, but we have this CD, Leslie of Bridging Heaven and Earth, yeah. that she and I wrote together. And it's like one of the first lines is that we can try too hard when it's easy. Yeah. And we build up the momentum, yeah. as you've been talking about and Michael was talking about in the first show, of like trying to attain something, trying to... You cannot attain enlightenment. Right. You can't. Enlightenment's going to happen within you. It, it exists. Yeah, it exists within you. Right. You can't attain to it. Just before, you can work so hard, and just before you actually become enlightened, you've forgotten that that was the goal. Because to become enlightened, you can't want it. Right, you can't. Yeah, yeah right. We, <laughs> what was the thing that we used to say about that? Uh, I'll think of it. Yeah. Yeah, go it wasn't bending over again. Was no, 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 that's over. different. That was, that was a different <laughs> okay. metaphor that, okay. that people already <laughs> go, he shouldn't have said that. <laughs> no. no, so... My journey has been about uh, helping people in that process and helping, and helping myself with it at the same time and, and understanding that, that I'm, I'm not their teacher. You know, I'm this, this point that can help them see themselves, but I don't teach them anything. And that's so difficult for people, especially in Japan, because when they go to school, they're there to be taught. That's, and they want a teacher. They want a teacher. They want somebody. So, so I did this conference with, we had a, a three years of graduates, and I did this, this conference with the graduates. And I said, now, um, everything that I've demonstrated and shown to you and we've talked about, you are better than all of that. You, you will take this in directions I can't imagine. And somebody stood up and said, we can't do that. They literally said, we've never been in a class where a teacher has said that, where somebody of authority has said, go beyond what I've done. So, Yeah, well, in the old traditions, that's because you would lose your power. Exactly, in the classroom. Uh, in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, this, this period we're in, you know, Alan, this is like, it is such a great time. And if... And if if the public knew what a great time it was, they would stop putting up with all the BS that's going on in this country and around the world. They would just not participate anymore. And not because they're angry at anyone, not because they want to get even or they want justice. They would just simply stop. There's something stop. better to do. Yeah, there is something far better to do. Right, a lot of times when there's a lot of drama around yeah. me, I'll think there must be something better. There I, must be a so, let whole think bunch of better, it. Yeah. yeah, right. Let's invent it if it doesn't <laughs> right. exist. Yeah. Oh. I mean, there are so many things that I personally were involved in. For me to get involved in this drama would have to be really oh. stupid. Yeah. <laughs> so in 30 seconds... Yeah. What would you want everybody to, to get out of this you know, beautiful hour? Stop judging yourself. Just stop it. Don't, don't do it anymore. It's like, um, look at yourself without having any thought about yourself. Just look at yourself. And at some point, in, in, at some moment, it's going to dawn on you who you are without that parental voice of telling you who you shouldn't be or who you could all be. All those concepts, yeah. all those judgments. Yeah. Just let go of it. It's of no value. As Michael said, we need to take up things that are valuable. Wow, beautiful. All right. So, uh, again, you know, there's an opportunity. You can feel it. You know it. You know it's growing. Um, you know, if you want inf in any information about Gary, the art project, uh, Aaron, Roger, anything about bridging, we have all the shows available on YouTube, all 260. Call me, Alan, 805-687-2053. Good night. We love you. Thank you for coming. God bless.